morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the transfer pricing webinar. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today where we're going to go through key transfer pricing matters for UAE businesses. We can see that the attendance is quite high, uh, so I can see that actually tax professionals are taking care of transfer pricing uh, right now which means that transfer pricing in the UAE is in a completely different place where it was um, a year ago. Um, now, the goal of the session is that we're going to go through key transfer pricing aspects, and the goal is to provide clarifications to all tax professionals from a UAE um, transfer pricing perspective. In the region or in the UAE, we can see different types of taxpayers. We have those taxpayers where the headquarter is based in the UAE with a lot of operations in the UAE and abroad. So during the presentation today, we're gonna be focusing on those, but also there are a lot of uh, inbound um, taxpayers that they are um, based in the UAE and they have operations in the UAE. So we also will be focusing on those type of taxpayers because transfer pricing is equally important to those type of taxpayers. Now, before, before we continue with the presentation, I just want to go through a few housekeeping uh, messages. Um, so for all of you, please note that um, the session uh, is being recorded today. Um, so please, um, you're going to be receiving a link where you can be able to provide, uh, to, to, to go through the presentation again. Uh, but again, if you have any questions or need any clarification, don't just go through the recording. Uh, I know that a lot of information will be shared today through the Trump Pricing webinar. Feel free also to contact Claire, Rami, or myself. Who, are, who is going to be presented today? Presenting today. In terms of um, questions, uh, when you register for the TP webinar, uh, you were asked if you had any transfer pricing question. So today during the webinar, we're going to be answering um, all questions that, or most questions that has been provided. A lot of questions, obviously, on free zones. A lot of questions in terms of transfer pricing documentation requirements. So all of those will be solved while uh, presenting all, this, all the sections uh, today. Lastly, uh, from a housekeeping perspective, uh, we will also share a link after the webinar. Uh, so we would like uh, all of you, if possible, to provide feedback. As you know, in KPMG, quality is top priority. So we would like to understand if something needs to be improved and, and obviously we want to continue improving. So please, uh, we would appreciate if you please share feedback with us after the session. Now, who is with you today and who is gonna be presenting um, to you today? It's gonna be myself. Um, my name is Antonio Tapia. I'm the head of uh, the transfer pricing team with KPMG Lower Golf. We also have Claire Bushel and Rami Ayer, both associate directors uh, within the transfer pricing team, and both of them based in the UAE. I'll introduce myself first, and then I'll pass, I'll pass the voice to, to Claire and, and Ramia. So for you to know who is presenting today, my name is Antonio Tapia. I'm based in the UAE. I came to the region um, like almost 10 years ago. So I've been based in the UAE for a long time now. Before coming to the region, I had international tax and transfer pricing experience in Europe. I was focused uh, mostly on uh, clients with presence in Europe, but I was based in Madrid. So then when I came to the region, um, what I've been doing basically is working uh, at the regional level, not only working for UAE clients, but also working with clients with the headquarters in Egypt, Saudi, Qatar, and Jordan. Because as you know, uh, in those jurisdictions, you already have uh, transfer pricing requirements. In terms of type of work that I've been doing, obviously uh, designing transfer pricing policies to identify major risks 
and opportunities from a transfer pricing perspective. But also once the, the transfer pricing policy has been designed, then we also been helping with transfer pricing documentation requirements at a global, regional and local level, um, helping on audits, um, helping on um, litigation as well in those jurisdictions that I mentioned before, due diligence and all type of transfer pricing uh, work that we have in the region. Now, I also have a couple of years of experience in Sydney where I was focusing on APAC. Uh, as you know, tax authorities in Sydney are quite complex. So during, during those two years, I was able to learn a lot um, on, on that jurisdiction in, in, in Australia. Um, focusing on, on APAC clients. Came back in 2020, and since then, and obviously with the implementation of the transfer pricing regulations in the UAE, our main focus now is to help uh, UAE uh, taxpayers uh, to be ready uh, for transfer pricing, um, considering that the corporate tax is being uh, implemented. Now, I stop here and I'll allow Claire to introduce herself. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, good morning, everybody. As Antonio said, my name is Claire Bouchel and I'm an associate director in the UAE transfer pricing team. I started my transfer pricing career back with the Irish Tax Authority and their transfer pricing audit team. And I was part of the, the team that conducted the first Irish transfer pricing audits. I've been in the region now for the last six years and my primary focus has been helping taxpayers implement transfer pricing policies as the region introduced TP. So I've worked with taxpayers in Saudi Arabia, in Qatar, the updates in Egypt, and most recently assisting Jordanian taxpayers in getting ready for the introduction of transfer pricing rules in their respective jurisdictions. And my main focus at the moment now is helping UAE taxpayers introduce appropriate and robust TP policies um, and assist with the implementation of transfer pricing here in the UAE. So I'll pass over now to Ramya to introduce herself. Thank you, Claire. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ramya Ayer, and I am an associate director with the, the tax transfer pricing team based in uh, the UAE. Um, I have uh, more, more than 15 years of uh, consulting experience, both in, uh, um, in several big fours and in-house roles. Um, I have advised multinational companies based in the Asia, Middle East and Africa and European uh, jurisdictions across industries. I have been with KPMG Lower Gulf since 2017 and I've worked with several regionally headquartered groups with their transurprising advisory projects, setting up policies uh, with their compliance activities, uh, due diligences, business expansion plans and uh, restructuring. Um, I am really excited uh, to present uh, during this webinar today and once again, thank you and thank everyone for taking this opportunity uh, or joining uh, this session and um, hopefully it will be an informative session for you. I will now hand it over to Antonio. Thank you very much, uh, Ramya. So going into the agenda for today, um, and I'm gonna be uh, going through it in a brief way. So um, six key topics to, to be discussed today. Um, first of, of them is basically going through what is the transfer pricing regulation that has been issued by the Ministry of Finance. We understand that not all taxpayers in the UAE are transfer pricing experts. So we want to give you the tools uh, to be able to understand where uh, all key points from a transfer pricing perspective are in all documents that has been issued by the Ministry of Finance. So this is the first uh, key point that we'll, we will be discussing. Second one will be what is considered at, uh, the arm's length principle and the importance of that in terms of uh, ranges, in terms of adjustment, in terms of comparability analysis, etc. Um, Ramya will, will go through that. After that, we're going to go through definitions of related parties, control and connected person, because as you know, transfer pricing regulation mostly or actually apply to those transactions with related parties, companies where there is control or transaction with connected persons. So those will need to be a term blend. So Ramya will be going through that as well, and she will be providing a few examples to make 
easier for the audience to understand uh, those, uh, those cases. So from a transfer pricing documentation requirement, we're gonna be going uh, in terms of documentation that is required, the local file, master file, TP form, if there are thresholds, which type of taxpayer has to prepare this documentation, etc. Um, so Claire will go uh, through that and also we'll be providing a few examples. Um, I will be going through a key uh, aspect of free zones and tax groups because as you know, a uh, few decisions were issued recently in, for tax group and free zones. And then last point, what I'll do is I'm going to summarize the key TP topics and explain what I consider should be the next steps for UAE businesses and where we are, what I think it needs to be done this year before the end of the year, but obviously for those uh, taxpayer who's, who has uh, 31st December year end because it will apply uh, corporate tax and transfer pricing for, from 1st of Jan. So what I would recommend for those taxpayers to do before the end of the year and what needs to be done later. So going through uh, main documents issued by the Ministry of Finance and what's been uh, the recent UA transfer pricing publications. As you know, the corporate tax law was issued by the end of the year, uh, last year. Um, and there are a few Trump pricing articles that I want to mention here because I consider it's key for all tax professionals in the UAE to understand where there are Trump pricing related matters in the, in the tax law. So basically, um, and I'm not going to go into detail, of course, because this is the part of the, of the uh, presentation today of the webinar. So the Armland's principle, Article 34, relative parties, control and connected person, which is key because the, obviously uh, what basically needs to be done right now is to understand the current policy within all multinational groups uh, with persons in the UAE and understand if those transactions are undertaken at arm's length. Um, qualifying free zone uh, person, we all know that transactions um, to be able to qualify uh, for a free zone, uh, qualifying free zone person, Article 34 and 55 need to be uh, complied. So that's key as well. A lot of um, operations in the UAE has done through free zones. So that's key here. Uh, a small business relief, um, transfer pricing documentation for companies doing that um, is not required. Another article for a taxable income for tax group, how it has to be calculated, key as well because a lot of multinational groups here in the UAE, they will be thinking about doing tax groups. So what's the transfer pricing implication on that? Um, transfer pricing documentation requirements, master file, local file, and TP form, uh, import, really, really important. And also the ministerial decision that was issued, clarifications, APA program, currently inactive, uh, but also in the, in the law and transitional rules to be ready for, for next year in terms of what needs to be done in terms of the balance sheet. Now, there are these explanatory guidelines where it actually provides further information on those articles, obviously on, on the whole law, but also on those articles that are uh, related to TP. So if you have any other questions or clarification required on those articles, please go to the explanatory guidelines because you will be having there more information. One of them, which is key, is where they say in the article 34 that the OECD uh, transfer pricing guidelines should be seen in order to calculate the arm's length principle. So that, for example, helps a lot. Now, in terms of documentation, uh, the ministerial decision 197, uh, where it's explained the different type of taxpayers and threshold for local file and who has to prepare master file. Uh, so that was clarified through the ministerial decision. And then also recently, in, during the last month, couple of uh, decisions, I mean, actually three, two for free zones and one for tax grouping were issued where it was explained what is qualifying activity, uh, qualifying income and excluded activities. Obviously, when, when we saw the type of qualifying activities, 
it's very related to transfer pricing. And I give just one example where um, treasury or financing activities or headquarters services could be considered as a qualifying activity. So obviously important to be very familiar with this cabinet decision because it has a lot of transfer pricing implications. And then from a tax group in perspective, uh, there are some, uh, they have mentioned in a couple of places the ambulance principle when a uh, financial statement need to be done for uh, individual taxpayers, obviously transaction need to be conducted at, at Armland. Now, I stop here, just wanted to give you an overview on the recent Trump pricing publications and where you should go in terms of uh, questions. Uh, obviously, uh, we are always happy to help. If any question, don't go just to the rules, come to us and we will be happy to, to clarify anything on, on any uh, Trump pricing related matters. Now, going to the next slide and focusing on um, the Amsterdam's principle, uh, my colleague Ramia will go through that uh, with you. Thanks, Antonio. All right, so on this slide, we want to present the arm's length principle under the UACT law. Article 34 provides that all transactions and arrangements between related parties must be at arm's length. The arm's length standard requires the transaction between related entities be conducted as if they were between unrelated entities with each party acting in their own interest. As Antonio mentioned, arm's length standard in UACD law is largely consistent with the OECD transfer pricing guidelines. When applying arm's length standard, you know, the, the following aspects need to be applied and starting with uh, the comparability factors that need to be uh, considered. And the first factor there is contractual terms. By contractual terms, we mean verbal or written contractual terms, such as payment terms, which are included in legal agreements. Characteristics of the arrangement or the transaction. Uh, by that we mean, say, what is the quality of service or product that is being considered, what is the volume, um, and, and so on and so forth, so the details of the arrangement and the transaction. Economic circumstances. By economic circumstances, we mean what is what are the market factors which are influencing the taxpayer's business, uh, say, what is the profile of the geographical location, uh, wh who are the competitors in, um, in the market, and what are the industrial factors, industry factors, um, and regulatory requirements, and so on and so forth, uh, which can impact the business of the taxpayer and everyone, uh, all, the, all the players operating in that particular industry. Uh, when we talk about functional profiles, and this for me is the essence of a transfer pricing analysis, and it relates to the functions performed, assets employed, and risks assumed by the entities which are involved in the transactional arrangement. Finally, the business strategies. So business strategies for um, an m and &E group or the taxpayer essentially is the long-term vision of long-term strategy uh, of the group, such as market penetration, diversification, and so on and so forth. So all of these factors need to be considered. Uh, moving on is uh, how to apply transfer pricing methods. Now, the arm's length standard must be determined by applying one or a combination of the following transfer pricing methods. First one being the comparable uncontrolled price method, uh, which relates to comparing the price which is charged by in a related party scenario compared to unrelated party transactions. Uh, typically, we see that this is applied in commodity transactions, financial transactions, or where the taxpayer has some internal, internal comparable prices, um, which are available, say, on the website or rate cards and so on. The second method is the resale price method, which aims to compare the gross margin data. Um, and by that, how do you apply this? This is typically applied in distributors where the taxpayer purchases goods from a related party and then sells to third party customers. And then we assess the gross margin data in, in such a case. 
The cost plus method is typically applied in a manufacturing or an assembly function. Again, we assess the gross margin data of the value that such taxpayer is adding in the purchase transaction. The fourth method is the transactional net margin method, TNMM, as it's widely known as, and a very common method. Because if you're not able, if the taxpayer is not able to apply the, the three methods, they often resort to applying this method, which aims to compare the net profitability of the taxpayer to independent businesses. Uh, the final method is transactional profit split method. As the name suggests, it essentially splits the profit between the transacting entities based on the contribution they make. Uh, to say uh, a highly integrated business um, of value, uh, including and intangibles and so on. Um, the UAE CT law provides that if the five methods cannot be applied, you can the taxpayer can choose any other methods as well. So now the the, th the third step really would be determining the arm's length range. And by arm's length range, we mean that a set of data points uh, which are available to the taxpayer based on uh, benchmarking exercise that is undertaken to identify independent transactions which are comparable to the taxpayer's business. Now, an arm's length range is a set of percentile points, right? And, and the expectation of authorities worldwide is uh, that the taxpayers price or profitability be very close to the median of that arm's length range. Now we're still waiting for further clarification on whether any point in that arm's length range could be uh, applied or the tax authorities would expect that the taxpayer operate in an interquartile range scenario. So once we have established all of this, the taxpayer really needs to apply the arm's length range of results and continuously monitor this. To the extent uh, the tax authorities, when, when they scrutinize, when they pick this up for scrutiny, figure or establish that the taxpayer hasn't really operated or hasn't met the arm's length standard, then they can go ahead and make an adjustment to the taxable income so that it reflects a true arm's length position. And this by this, uh, this is referred to as the primary adjustment. Um, and this can often raise a double taxation of sorts. So there is another provision in the law which talks about corresponding adjustments, where if the tax authority has made a primary adjustment, it can also adjust the taxable profit of the related party. Um, and the another provision uh, in the CT law provides that if a corresponding adjustment or if an adjustment has been made by a foreign tax authority of the related party, then the taxpayer can apply to the UA tax authorities to make a corresponding adjustments to reflect the true position of the business. So we, we spoke about the fact uh, related parties, and uh, this slide really focuses on the definition of related parties and control. Uh, so when we when we speak about related parties, it refers to all individuals or entities, and these are the examples, or these are uh, 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 these are the examples which uh, the UA provisions provide. Um, and it starts with the usual parent subsidiary or branch relationships entities under common control, exempt and non-exempt business activities of the same person, uh, partners in unincorporated partnerships, and there is also a provision which refers to the fourth degree of kinship. By that, it means that individuals in, in their capacity are also related parties, and fourth degree of kinship allows that a, a relationship where you have a grandfather or a grandson or great, 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 uh, grandfather and great great grandson and you know the whole end to end spectrum uh, can form and can be treated as uh, treated as related parties to the taxable person the other aspect which the law provides is the definition of control and control essentially is the ability of a person to influence another person and these are the the broad categories where a person may influence 
the, the taxable person's business. Uh, the first one is exercising 50% or more of the voting rights of another person. The second is determining uh, when, when such a person can determine the composition of the board, determine more than 50% uh, of the composition of the board of directors. Whether this, tax, this person receives more than 50% or more of the profits of the taxable person. And even if it's not covered under these three buckets, if this person can significantly influence the conduct of the business and affairs of another person, uh, you know, it is said that control is established. Uh, moving on, let's talk about connected persons. So the UACT law does not limit itself to related parties, but also connected persons. By connected persons, we mean individuals which are related to taxable persons. A UACT law says that any payment which is excessive, uh, so any excessive payments which are made to a person who is a connected person to the taxable person shall be disallowed. And uh, by connected person, this brings into the ambit any director or officer, any individual with direct or indirect ownership interest or control in the taxable person's business, any related party to such an officer or individual um, and partners in an unincorporated partnership. So just to you know explain these concepts a little further, uh, we let's take an example. So in this example, you have um, a group, uh, the ACO group, which has subsidiaries um, in the UA and outside the UA and also a branch outside the UA. Now the question really is which of these entities are related to ACO? And the answer to that is by virtue of just ownership stake or voting rights, we see that BCO, which is you know 99% uh, held by ACO, ECO, which is also 99% held by BCO, uh, so indirect under indirect ownership becomes a, a related party to ECO. The branch of ECO in a foreign jurisdiction is also a related party in that sense. But then what is also important is control right and uh, which is why we'll have to evaluate whether deco fco and and that individual within ue is also in a position to influence the business operations and hence may also come within the ambit uh, of uh, the ue transfer pricing or you know to meet the arms length standard i hope this is clear and we move on to the next set of examples where you have a group um, where you have the parent entity and there is an owner to this entity. The, and the first question really is, what is the impact on the interest paid by the parent company to the owner from a TP standpoint? Uh, as you see, we can say that the owner is a connected person to the parent company, and this interest needs to be at arm's length. Otherwise, any excessive interest amount can be disallowed. Moving on, the second example really is where uh, there is interest paid by ACO to the parent company. And the answer really here is that it needs to be at arm's length, but you would also see, and this will be covered later, that parent co and ACO can, be, can, can form part of the same CT group and any transactions within the CT group do get eliminated. The third example here is any payment in the form of salary, bonus, or any other monetary perks which ACO uh, you know, provides to the director, any, pay, any such payment which is made to a director or uh, an official of uh, ACO. And the answer here is that this, again, needs to be comparable to payments made to independent persons because a director, in its sense, uh, is treated as a connected person to ACO. So uh, with that, I think what is critical here is that each individual, each tax taxable person uh, needs to evaluate, needs to look at all their transactions and arrangements with related parties um, and, and, and then take a very conscious call on uh, uh, on their uh, uh, arrangements uh, from a transfer pricing uh, perspective. Uh, with that, I pass on 
to Claire, who would talk through the UAE transfer pricing documentation requirements. Thank you, Ramia. Hello, everyone. So we're now going to walk through the UAE transfer pricing documentation requirements. So, as Ramia mentioned, um, you know, taxpayers must comply with the arms length standard and identify the related parties. And the UAE regime has introduced three types of documentation, which would be used then to show and to illustrate compliance with the arms length standard. So, the UAE TP regime has introduced three TP documentation requirements. So, they are the master file, the local file, and the TP disclosure form. Two of these documents are OECD compliant TP documents, and that's the master file and local file. So, to multinational um, to taxpayers who are members of multinational groups, you know, some of these may already be familiar because you may also be preparing these in other jurisdictions that already have TP, um, TP rules. So, we'll walk you through each of these documentation um, over this slide. So, the first document is the master file, and this is a group wide document and it includes information about the group as a whole. So, that would mean it would include information about the group's overall structure, the locations it's in, its overall supply chain, information about intangibles, and information about the financing activities of that group. It's typically prepared by the head office. So, again, to UAE taxpayers that are members of foreign old multinational groups, check with your head office if one of these is already being prepared, because if so, it can be harnessed from, from a UAE perspective to meet this, um, this documentation requirement. Um, the master file is due 30 days upon request. So, that means it's not annually submitted. It just needs to be annually prepared and maintained and then provided 30 days upon request from the UAE tax authority. The second document is the local file. So, while the master file contained information about the group as a whole, the local file contains information about the local entity and its local operations. So, that would include information about the local activities, the functions performed, assets used, risks borne, and the organization structure of that entity, and detailed information about the related party transactions that that entity um, is conducting. And and the local file is used to show compliance with arm's length. So, for those related party transactions, you would also include potentially some benchmarking analysis or comparables to show and illustrate you are complying with the arm's length standard. Similar to the master file, it does not need to be annually submitted. It is um, due 30 days upon request from the UAE tax authority. And finally, the third um, document, uh, TP document required from a UA perspective, and arguably the most important, is the TP disclosure form. So, this, this document must be annually submitted. So, it's annually submitted as part of the tax return. Therefore, it's due nine months after the taxable entity's year end. Now, the UAE Ministry has not yet introduced the template for this form, but if we look at the region and jurisdictions with similar requirements, what we've seen other jurisdictions um, require out of, this, out of similar forms is high-level, entity-level financial information and details about the intergroup transactions. So, typically, a disclosure form would require the taxpayer to identify their related party transactions, to list them, to list the counterparties involved, the location of the counterparties, the nature of the transaction, the TP method used to price them, and the quantum of the transaction. And what we've seen regionally from tax authorities is that they typically use a TP disclosure form as a kind of a first step risk assessment tool. So they would analyze and scrutinize the, these TP disclosure forms. So if taxpayers have transactions maybe with high risk tax jurisdictions, so jurisdictions with lower corporate tax rates than the UAE, or if you have a UAE entity that's consistently making losses. These would be the types of triggers that the UAE tax authority are likely to pick up on, and that may require them or warrant them to request a copy of the master file and local file, and then if they're still not satisfied, they may then ultimately open a TP audit. So, it's important then that UAE taxpayers take note of these three documentation standards and prepare them, see what they're in scope for, and, give, and make sure that their preparation is consi consistent across all documentation standards. So, we'll move on now to who potentially is in scope of the TP documentation standards. So, it's important to note that the disclosure form is part of your corporate tax regime. So, every taxable person is required to prepare a UAE TP disclosure form. However, the master file and local file, there is specified thresholds, and it's only if you breach these thresholds are you required to prepare these documentation standards. So, Ministerial Decision 97, which was published in the last few weeks, has detailed that 
only UAE taxpayers that are either members of multinational groups that have consolidated turnover above 3.15 billion dirham or UAE entities that have turnover above 200 million dirham are required to prepare master files and local files. So what we've done and what I think is important for UAE taxpayers is to kind of map out how you fall into um, the UAE TP documentation regime. So there's certain questions you need to ask yourself in order to determine what are the documentations that you're in scope of. So the first one is, are you a taxable person in the UAE? If no, you don't need to prepare any TP documents from a UAE perspective. If yes, then you definitely must prepare a TP disclosure form. And your second question is, do you breach the local file and master file thresholds? So does the entity have revenue above 200 million dirham or does the group have revenue above 3.15 billion dirham? If no, you just need to prepare the disclosure form. If yes, then the entity also must prepare a UAE local file and a master file. In addition, in Ministerial Decision 97, um, the UAE authorities also sp explicitly specified certain transactions that must be included in the local file and that can be excluded from the local file. And typically the transactions that must be included are transactions where potentially they're taking place with another, with a taxpayer that may be subject to either a lower rate of CT or not in scope of the CT regime. And therefore there is potential for tax arbitrage or the shifting of profits. So on the right here, we have reference what must be what transactions must be included in the local file. So firstly, you'd have transactions with non-resident persons. So if a UAE taxpayer has a transaction with the related party in, say, Saudi Arabia or France, this transaction must be included in the local file. If the UAE taxpayer has a transaction with an exempt person, so that would be a UAE entity that is not in scope of the CT regime, these transactions also must be included in the local file. If the UAE taxable person has a transaction with a related party who's benefiting of small business relief, this must be included. And again, because the person benefiting from small business relief would not be in scope of the full CT regime, so therefore this, this transaction also must be in place. And certain taxpayers may need to check with some of your related parties to consider, are you actually benefiting from small business relief? So you may need to check with your related parties if they are applying or if they're in scope of any of these additional kind of requirements. And finally, the other types of transactions that must be included are transactions with resident persons who are subject to a different CT rate. So in general, this would mean transactions with, say, free zone entities. So where you have a transaction between a mainland entity and a free zone entity, if the free zone entity is benefiting from the 0%, that would mean they're subject to a different CT rate. And therefore, these transactions would, would um, should be documented in a local file. It's important to note the local file threshold under Ministerial Decision 97 specifies that, you know, only UAE taxpayers with turnover above 200 million dirham must prepare a local file. But what we would also note is that free zone entities, one of the conditions of you benefiting from the 0% free zone rate is that you are complying with the arm's length standard. And therefore, our recommendation would be that any free zone entity, even below the threshold of 200 million dirham, they should also be preparing and maintaining a local file so that if they do get any queries from the tax authorities to requesting that they show they are complying with the arms and standard, they can produce their local file and show that they've robust TP support in place to show that they are complying with that arms length standard. So we'll now move on to the next question. And I suppose what we've tried to do here is to provide an example of who is actually in scope of specific TP documentation. So on the left, we have a US headquartered group. So it can be a UAE headquartered group as well. And we have various entities located across the region. So we have a number of UAE entities across mainland and free zone, which includes branches, shared services center and financing companies. And we also have an Omani and a KSA um, operation companies. So who is in scope of the UAE disclosure form? And the answer is every, every UAE taxpayer is in scope of the disclosure form. So the disclosure form is applicable to all UAE entities, regardless of thresholds, regardless of whether you're free zone or mainland, and regardless of the activities of that entity. So once you're a taxable person, you are in scope of the disclosure form. We'll move on then to the next example, which is focused on who's in scope of the local file and master file. So as I mentioned, under Ministerial Decision 97, certain thresholds were set. Um, to see whether taxpayers would be in scope of the local file and master file. So it's not then enough just to look at whether the, 
the entity is a UAE taxable person, we also need to look at the financials at a group level and at an entity specific level. So in this group, we can see that the global uh, revenue of the group is less than 3.15 billion euro. So that means the group hasn't met the first threshold of revenue above 3.15 billion euro. So now we need to look at the revenue and turnover at the individual UAE entity level. So now who is in scope of the local file? So what you can see is that entities that have turnover above the 200 million dirham are in scope of the UAE local file and master file. So that would be your UAE Opco in mainland and Friesen and the UAE branch. The three of these have turnover above the 200, 200 million dirham. And we'll move on then to our last example of who's in scope of the TP documentation. So everything in this scenario is the same, except now the global turnover of the group is above 3.15 billion. So now when we ask who is in scope of the local file and master file, every UAE entity is in scope of the UAE local file and master file because they've the group as a whole has breached the 3.15 billion dirham threshold. So what's important then for groups to remember is that it's important to consider what types of what documents within the TP regime are you in scope of? So look at the decision trees, whether you're a taxable person, whether you breach the thresholds and what type of related party transactions you have so that you can develop you know, robust and consistent TP policies and apply them across the TP disclosure form, the local file and the master file. And then again, these can be produced to the tax authority, either submitted as part of your tax return for the disclosure form or submitted upon request from the tax authority to show appropriate support for the arm's length um, nature of your pricing. And I will move on and um, I'll hand over to Antonio for the TP implication of tax groups. Thank you very much, Claire, for that. That was very clear. Um, so going into transfer pricing implication for tax group, and I'm going to go directly to the key important areas. So, so basically, um, as you might know, I mean, we have a lot of uh, multinational groups here in the UAE who are actually thinking about doing tax grouping, basically because, as you know, and that was included as part of the corporate tax law, like uh transaction between to, for the calculation for the taxable income transaction between uh companies within the same tax group will be eliminated which uh, actually it's helped a lot from a trump pricing compliance burden because um you might need to be focusing on other transaction not those one between uh the one within the within the same tax group so if I am a tax professional and I am considering to do it tax, a tax group, then my focus would be on related party transactions with not obviously uh, those ones within the same tax group, but it would be with um, those entities that are located in the UAE, but are not part of the same um, tax group. Um, those transactions um, with exempt entities located in the UAE. Obviously, um, companies that qualify uh, from a free zone uh, perspective, that they are considered qualifying free zone person, and those transactions with uh, foreign, foreign entities. So if you are actually considering to do a tax group, please, focus on those transactions because as I mentioned before, the other, the transaction between the entities within the same tax group will be eliminated from a taxable uh, income perspective. Now, what does it mean from a transfer pricing documentation requirement? This means that you'll have only uh, one uh, taxpayer by tax group. Uh, we have seen also that in, in a few groups that we are currently helping. They are actually considering to have uh, different tax groups, which means that it might be required to do uh, um, to prepare documentation per taxpayer. So one tax group means one taxpayer. So the more than tax group meal means uh, multiple uh, taxpayer. But just just for you to know, obviously that from a transfer pricing documentation uh, perspective. Um, only one local file will be required for for a tax group because there is only one taxpayer. It would be the same for 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 the master file, and it will be as well the same for for the TP form. Now, I also wanted to explain 
uh, a few considerations that I have seen uh, during the last few weeks, uh, because potentially there would be less uh, Trump pricing compliance burden. But if you also consider the threshold that was explained by Claire, where you need to see if the local um, entity is revenue are above uh, 200 million, then you could be in a situation where individually um, the, the local uh, taxpayer without doing any tax group, then they would be below the Trump pricing uh, thresholds. Um, the 200 million, but if you actually consider like all entities within the same tax group, you would be in a you could be in a position that you probably could have more uh, transfer pricing document documentation requirements doing a tax group than not doing the tax group because you're actually going to meet the threshold. So I have seen that um, during the last few weeks. So I also obviously wanted to 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 mention that to to all of you because we we have seen that. Um, on now focusing on, on qualifying free zone persons, uh, as you know, uh, there were a few, um, uh, decision that were issued. One is the number 55 and, and the ministerial decision number 139. But before going to that, I mean, what you know from the corporate tax law is that to be able to be considered as a qualifying free zone person, uh, the, the entity needs to comply with the Article 34 and Article 55. Now, what does it mean, Article um, 30, 34 and Article 55? This means that um, Article 34 is transaction uh, between the, the free zone person and related parties and connected person need to be at arm length. But also, uh, this means that all transfer pricing documentation requirements uh, need to be met by the free zone person. What does it mean? This means what Claire explained, which basically is transfer pricing for master file and local file. And for that also, we might need to go to the ministerial decision to see if the thresholds are met, to understand if technically the free zone person is required to do the local file, master file and, and the TP4. Now, as Claire mentioned, our recommendation would be that even though the free zone person is below the threshold, our recommendation would be always to prepare transfer pricing documentation to demonstrate at any point that transaction uh, between the free zone person and related parties and connected person at arm length. Now, there is also one, one point in Article 55 which mentioned that tax authorities has the right to ask for any transfer pricing, document, uh, pricing supporting documentation to, to explain that transaction at arm length. So that's why is that I wouldn't, I would recommend to be able to show that transactions are at time length for any free zone and be able to apply the 0% tax rate to always comply with the transfer pricing documentation and have everything in place. Now, the cabinet decision and the ministerial decision that was issued, there are definitions of uh, qualifying activities, excluded activities and qualifying income, right? So. From a transfer pricing perspective, we've seen that different type of um, activities that imply uh, related party transactions. I mean, there are more qualifying activities. I just included here the one that I consider are more relevant from a transfer pricing perspective. Now, we you, qualifying activities is considered manufacturing. So this probably means that there would be acquisition of raw material or selling of goods. So that is uh, potentially considered as a related party transaction. Distribution activities might be considered as qualifying activities. So this means also that the distribution entity might be acquiring goods from potentially a related party or selling to a related party. So again, uh, Trump pricing implications there. Holding of share, it might be some um, services to related parties. And then two key ones, which are uh, headquarter services, which might be management services to related parties, or financing activities who might be, which might be loans, credit, cash pooling, etc., to related parties. So, those qualifying activities 
So apparently that income from those qualifying activities might be exempt, but at the same time, you actually need to be sure that all those transactions under the qualifying activities are actually a term blend. That's critical. Now, there is also one activity that was considered as excluded activity, which actually is the ownership and exploitation of IP. Now, I understand that a lot of uh, multinational groups here in the region, uh, sorry, in the UAE might have uh, together uh, those type of activities that are considered as qualifying activities and then also probably owning or licensing the IP. So internally, uh, tax professional need to consider uh, what might be the implications because um, th there could be a situation where the whole, uh, the, the free zone entity might not qualify uh, because it has um, excluded activities. And one that is very common, obviously, is ownership and exploitation of IP. So this is something that all uh, free zone entity need to consider right now. Um, obviously, we have the minimus uh, rule where no qualifying income should be below 5 million or 5% of the total revenue. So this is something that needs to be um, uh, reviewed by all tax professionals here in the UAE to understand implication on free zone and be able to pay the 0% tax. And then on that, uh, on, on the decision also, it's included uh, that a free zone person might have domestic or foreign permanent establishment, and they have specifically mentioned that they should be treated as independent parties and therefore attribution of profit to the, to the uh, permanent establishment uh, need to be done uh, at arm length. Now, key, key takeaways for today that I want you to remember, which is really, really important. So um, for you to know that Trump repricing requirements are definitely in line with the OECD Trump repricing guidelines with some specifics, uh, particularly on, on the Trump repricing documentation. Um, all transactions with related parties need to be at arm length. That's actually really important because this is a starting point of everything. And um, payment to connected person need to be at, um, at market value um, and, have, and has a business purpose to be able to, to be uh, considered as deductible. Uh, TP form uh, needs to be uh, filed with the city return without any threshold. Master file, local file need to be uh, prepared but not submitted um, under, under a threshold. Uh, there is an APA uh, arrangement available, which is currently inactive, but we might see more development on that uh, going forward. From a city group perspective, uh, which we have a lot here, or we might, go, we might have a lot here in the future, um, to focus on a specific transaction, which are those ones which are not the one uh, undertaken within the same tax group. And, and then the transfer pricing requirements uh, from a documentation perspective, uh, potentially to have less burden, but there are some specific cases. Free zone entities, really important transaction to be at arm length, uh, and transfer pricing documentation ready, which is not only local file, but also TP for a master file to be able to be considered as a qualified free zone person. And a small business relief really doesn't have the obligation to prepare transfer pricing uh, documentation, only to have um, transaction at arm length. Now, going into the what I think is the action for businesses in the UAE. On the left box uh, dotted lines in clear blue, it's what I consider it need to be done right now, or actually a few things probably should have been done already. Uh, so there are like <clears throat> three, three different uh, points that need to be uh, addressed, right? One is to understand, uh, to be ready <clears throat> for the transfer, transfer pricing in the UAE, which means that we need to, I mean, tax prof professionals in the UAE should have uh, informed uh, stakeholders and what might be the, the that there might be implication from a transfer pricing perspective, a study need to be done, risk analysis from a transfer pricing perspective need to, done, need to be done, et cetera. And obviously staying, away, staying uh, updated with uh, transfer pricing development, which means 
uh, cabinet decision and, minister, and ministerial decisions. Now, when this is done, which probably is being done by all of you already, um, then the next step is to understand the different type of related parties of uh, the entities here in the UAE, who is considered as connected person, what are the intercompany transactions, and understand what is the TP uh, exposure or, or risk, which basically is what where we are now with a lot, a lot, a lot multinational groups at the moment, which is basically doing uh, transfer pricing risk assessment to understand what the TP policy is. And, and obviously, I mean, there are a lot of transactions that are not considered at arm's length because we didn't have transfer pricing regulations uh, before. So uh, for a lot of, uh, I mean, what we've seen is that for international transactions, a lot of the transactions are already at arm's length, but a lot of domestic transactions, they're still not. So um, we're doing a lot of work from a transfer pricing uh, risk analysis perspective. And we also, I mean, the next step that we do in basically is that when we identify all of those risks and we understand that a few transactions are not undertaken at arm length, what we do is to define and help all tax uh, professionals in the UAE to be able to define a, a transfer pricing policy, which includes also preparation of benchmarkings, et cetera, et cetera. So, those three things is what we consider it need to be done right now. I understand that most of you will have a 31st December as a year end, which means that from 1st of January, uh, transfer pricing will be applicable to you. So this uh, left box on in clear blue is what needs to be done uh, before the end of the year. Now, the rest on the right side, it might come later, which is once you have the transfer pricing policy defined, benchmarking analysis, etc., then um, you need to be uh, you need to prepare the local file, the master file, and be able to have the, all the supporting documentation to to show tax authorities that your transaction is a, are undertaken at arm length. But what is critical now before the end of the year is to do the whole analysis and be able to, to have a real uh, a good uh, transfer pricing policy in place. Then in a few years, we'll have disputes, um, but still uh, from our UAE perspective, this is something that we are not looking at in the, uh, in the future, in the, probably in the next year. We'll probably see this after in a, in a couple of years or so. So again, just to summarize here, please focus on understanding the transfer pricing um, situation in terms of related parties, tr related party transaction, transaction with connected person, which risk you might have for all of those, and then be able to design a transfer pricing policy before the end of the year, including uh, any, any benchmarking that it's required. Now, a few things are still uh, pending to be clarified by the Ministry of Finance. Um, for example, uh, we, are, we don't know what will be considered as uh, arm's length range. We still don't know that. We don't know the form uh, or the, 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 the TP form. We still don't know how it's going to be the format, as Claire mentioned or the local file and the master file, we still don't know the format. We know that it might be potentially aligned with the OCD guidelines, but still uh, we don't have information about that. Uh, APA, we might be expecting uh, more information in terms of uh, if it might be active at some point. So again, uh, a lot of things still need to be clarified from a transfer pricing perspective. Um, and, and we obviously will be informing all of you as, as they come from, uh, from tax uh, alert perspective, et cetera. Now, I just want to say thank you uh, to everyone. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be presenting to you uh, transfer pricing um, for UAE businesses. Um, of course, if you have any question, if you need any help, uh, you have there my telephone number, you have all our emails from Claire, Ramia and myself. So please, uh, any questions, clarification that you need from a transfer pricing perspective, we know that 
there is a lot of work now. I mean, we are super busy, but obviously we are super happy to help all of you. So please uh, feel free to reach out to any of us and we will be very, very happy to help. Um, thank you very much and hopefully you enjoy the session and it's been a product productive one for you and, and you enjoy. Have a good day.